Hello, I'm Lauren Coronado. John White and Karen Devine have the night off. Tonight, live at 5. A lot of law enforcement people that I don't know don't work days and nights to make this happen. I'd like to thank you for the bottom of my heart. The man accused of shooting and killing a police officer in Northern California is in custody tonight, where police found him and why two other people were arrested in connection to the case. Plus, volunteers are helping out at Joshua Tree National Park, while the partial government shutdown continues, why they're doing their part to help visitors. And cooler temperatures could have an impact on crops grown here in the valley, how locals are reacting. You're watching KESQ, the desert's news leader. This is News Channel 3, live at 5. The man accused of shooting and killing police officer in California has been captured. Officials say 33-year-old Gustavo Perez Aragia shot and killed Newman Police Corporal Ron Singh on Wednesday while the officer was responding to a call. Police arrested Ariaga in Bakersfield this morning. As Marcy Gonzalez reports, the sheriff there announcing two accomplices were arrested in addition to the gunman. Handcuffed and in custody, the suspect accused of killing Newman Police Corporal Raniel Singh Wednesday morning finally captured today, about 200 miles away in Bakersfield, California. Singh's brother breaking down in gratitude. I was waiting for this to happen. I'd like to thank you, working day and night to make this happen. Police finding Gustavo Perez Ariaga while in a house executing a search warrant, arresting him and several alleged accomplices. They misled us. They provided information that was false, all in an attempt to protect their brother, who we also know was trying to flee to Mexico. The Stanislaus County Sheriff says Ariaga is in the U.S. illegally, that he crossed over from Mexico several years ago, had two prior arrests for DUI and known gang affiliations. And under SB 54 in California, law enforcement would have been prevented, prohibited from sharing any information with ICE. President Trump tweeted during the manhunt, time to get tough on border security. That the outcome could have been different if law enforcement wasn't restricted, prohibited, or had their hands tied because of political interference. It was during a DUI stop that police say the 33-year-old suspect started a gun battle with Corporal Singh, killing the seven-year veteran of the force just hours after he celebrated Christmas with his wife and five-month-old son. There's a lot of people out there that misses him. Ariaga faces multiple charges. Authorities say those handcuffs he wore to be transferred back to Northern California belonged to Corporal Singh. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. And again, authorities say Ariaga was attempting to flee to Mexico. Sheriff Christensen says the arrest wouldn't have happened without the help from federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. Well, it's now been a week since the federal government was shut down, affecting operations at Joshua Tree National Park. With the park staff on furlough, the local Joshua Tree community is taking it upon themselves to maintain it. News Channel 3's Jeremy Chen followed up with some of those volunteers this morning. Cleaning bathrooms weren't in the plans for Zabra Purdy and Seth Zaharias when December began, instead expecting to help rock climbers in Joshua Tree National Park during the holiday travel rush. This is the busiest 10 days of the entire year, typically speaking. But these rock climbing guides are doing the dirty work because who else can do it with almost no park staff? Government shutdown and how you can help. These two are just some of the volunteers mobilized from the local community trying to maintain the park the best they can and taking it upon themselves to make sure everything is stocked, even while working on their own business. During our peak season, like I'm guiding every day and then in my free hour or two in the evening, I'm running to the park and cleaning toilets. Not to mention we're about $400 out um, on cash buying toilet paper. Lots and lots of toilet paper. Purdy and Zaharias estimates approximately 20,000 visitors a day come through during the year-end holidays. With no staff collecting park fees and visitors still coming in, they've noticed some rules being overlooked. Yes. We're seeing a lot of, you know, dogs off leash or where they're not supposed to be, going on trails where dogs are not allowed to go. However, the guides say it hasn't been a complete free-for-all with most visitors respecting the park. Some have even taken notice and offered direct donations to their volunteer work. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> 
One visitor says he and his family are grateful for the local help. I love it that the locals are taking it upon themselves because it means that everybody can come out here and enjoy it despite the, uh, the government shutdown. That wasn't the case five years ago. During the 2013 government shutdown where the entrance was blocked to all visitors, a devastating blow to Purdy and Zaharias' business at the time. That just about put us out of business and we had to cover payroll on a credit card for those two weeks. This time, though, they're booked with rock climbers through January 2nd. With the park remaining open this time, the guides say it's been a blessing and a curse and say volunteers can't maintain the park forever. I'm hoping that a federal government gets it together and comes up with an agreement here shortly. An agreement that's not likely coming until after the new year. Jeremy Chen, News Channel 3, Joshua Tree. And the local Joshua Tree community is accepting donations to assist those volunteers. All money given will go towards buying more supplies. And we have more details available on how you can help on our website, KESQ.com. Well, well, we are still seeing cooler temperatures in the valley. First alert, Chief Meteorologist Haley Clausen is tracking your conditions. Haley, it was so chilly today. Is it going to stay that way all the way into the weekend? It certainly is. Actually, tonight and tomorrow night are going to be the coldest nights ahead of us. So get ready. This afternoon, yeah, it was cooler than what we felt yesterday. We actually had our low, te or excuse me, our high temperatures in the low 60s all across the Coachella Valley at this hour. Cooled off into the 50s. Get ready. Those temperatures will only continue to drop as that sun sinks further and further behind the mountains. And it's not just the temperatures. We're also adding a bit more of a chill because of the wind out there. Our winds out of the north just providing very brisk conditions. 27 mile per hour wind gust right now in Whitewater, 24 miles per hour in Desert Hot Springs, and 22 miles per hour in Indio. We're going to be keeping that wind with us throughout the rest of this evening. Sustain close to 10 miles per hour on average, but again, those gusts up to about 20, 25 on average. Humidity staying low and those temperatures, whew, they're are going to be finding themselves in the 40s before you know it. So bundle up, add on the layers for your Friday night, and I will have your complete weekend forecast coming up in a few minutes. All right, thank you, Haley. Well, those cooler temperatures we're feeling this weekend will also have an impact on our local crops and possibly the cost of your produce. Coachella Valley farmers are preparing for crops to potentially freeze or become damaged with dropping overnight temperatures. Although the harvest season is nearing the end for red bell peppers and lettuce, cool overnight temperatures and wind could damage remaining produce yet to be packed and shipped in our local fields. Some farmers are adding water to their crops as a preventative measure by using water that's warmer than the air temperature as a way to insulate plants and protect them from freezing. General Manager at Peter Rabbit Farms in Coachella explains what happens to crops that freeze. There's no, there's no tip burn, there's no frost. You don't see frost damage. Typically when after the freeze what you're going to see in these leaves you'll see a blister open up in about two weeks. That would, what, that would be caused by the freeze conditions. And so far, there's nothing out here. Everything's in perfect condition. Good news. And if red pepper fields were to see significant damage from the cold weather, prices could jump to double what they normally are. During this winter weather, it's a good idea for homeowners to take precautions by covering up plants. We've heard Haley say that a lot, bringing pets indoors and keeping an eye on outdoor irrigation systems too. And it has been a week since the partial government shutdown began. They got back to us last night and said, we're leaving. That's it. No more discussions. So the discussions have broken down. Next on News Channel 3, the latest on talks to get a real a deal done to reopen the government as the president threatens to shut down the southern border. Plus, we're learning new details on a person killed by a train yesterday in the East Valley. What we know about the person killed. And a local golf standout will once again be competing in the Valley's PGA event. We have the details on Charlie Ryder playing in the Desert Classic next month. You're watching KESQ, the Desert's News Leader.
It's day seven of the partial government shutdown, and President Trump is threatening to shut down the entire U.S.-Mexico border. That's if lawmakers don't provide the money for his border wall. As Kenneth Moten reports, the Secretary of Homeland Security made a trip to El Paso, Texas, following the deaths of two migrant children in U.S. custody. A week into the partial government shutdown, President Trump is tweeting an ultimatum. Fund his wall or he'll be forced to close the entire southern border. It's the only way we can get the Democrats' attention. Shutting down the border, a move that could have major negative impacts on commerce and the U.S. economy as the president plays hardball with Democrats. We made an offer last Saturday night. They uh, told us to, that they'd get back to us by the end of the week. They got to, back to us last night and said, we're leaving. That's it. No more discussions. So the discussions have broken down. The White House reportedly brought Trump's $5 billion demand down to $2.1 billion. Democratic leaders say they offered three options to reopen the government, including $1.3 billion for border security, not for the president's, quote, immoral, ineffective, and expensive wall. Border security, the focus of DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen's trip to Texas Friday. The visit comes after the recent deaths of two migrant Guatemalan children in U.S. custody, including Felipe Gomez Alonso, whose mother spoke, saying, It was a surprise when my husband said that my son died. When I said goodbye to him, he was healthy. Facilities in El Paso so overcrowded, ICE released 1,600 migrant families into the community this week without processing them. It is unacceptable to release families with children, some of them very young children, to the street. ICE blamed Congress, saying it's only allowed to hold migrant families for 20 days. As for the shutdown and wall funding, the fight is expected to continue into the new year, likely impacting pay for federal workers and at least one branch of the military, the U.S. Coast Guard. Kenneth Moten, ABC News, Washington. We now know the name of a man killed in a train crash in Thermal. 39-year-old Crescentio Carrasco of Cathedral City was hit just before 11.30 a.m. near Avenue 62 and Highway 111. Carrasco was pronounced dead at the scene. Deputies are still investigating the cause of the incident. And police are investigating a man found dead at a Thousand Palms truck stop yesterday. Police were called to the 72,200 block of Varner Road around 2 o'clock after a man was found dead at that truck stop. Authorities say they believe foul play is not involved in the man's death. The man's identity and cause of death have not yet been released. And a boy injured by a laser tag toy after it exploded. Exploded right in his face. <laughs> Next on News Channel 3, what the boy's mother is saying about what exactly happened. Today was cooler than what we felt yesterday, and tomorrow's looking to be very similar with our afternoon highs, only finding themselves in the low 60s. Still plenty of sunshine, and we're going to need that after a very cold start with our low temperatures finding themselves in the 30s and 40s across the Coachella Valley. Well, the wind, it may be sticking with us for now, but yet another wind event will be with us as we get ready to head into the new year. I'll time it all out for you. Coming up next, you're watching News Channel 3, The Desert's News Leader.
A Utah boy ended up in the hospital on Christmas after hurting his eye with a toy gun. But this wasn't a BB gun or any gun that shoots a projectile at all. As Tanya Dean reports, it was a toy laser gun that blew up in his face. It was Christmas. I hurt my Aye. Christmas is meant to be remembered, yeah. but not like this. Am I going to be blind? Seven-year-old Kempton Kirkwood got a lot of cool gifts this year. This is a ship from Star Wars, and those rockets in there that you can shoot. But had his eye on something extra special, a laser tag gun. When he opened it Christmas morning, though, something wasn't right. Yeah. A battery got stuck, and the laser tag gun started to get hot. That's when it exploded. It just kind of popped and exploded right in his face. Home security camera footage shows exactly how it happened. When I was getting the battery out, I saw stuff come out of it into my eye. It hurt a lot. Kempton's family rushed him to the ER. His mom knows an accident like this is rare, but she wants to warn other parents just in case. If you sense something going wrong, kind of just trust your instinct. If there's a battery and it's heating up, get as far away from it as possible. As for Kempton, he's going to be okay. With Skelly and I was brave. And hopefully next Christmas isn't quite this memorable. That was Tanya Dean reporting, and the guns manufacturer asked the Kirkwoods to send them receipts for their medical bills. The family does not plan to file a lawsuit. Now, first alert weather with Chief Meteorologist Haley Clausen. When you look at our satellite and radar, everything looks nice and calm and beautiful. And that's what it is when we're talking about our sky conditions. But calm is not a word you could use to describe today's weather because those winds were blowing a very dry, brisk northerly wind. And some of those wind gusts exceeding 30 miles per hour right here in the Coachella Valley. Palm Springs coming in with a peak wind gust of 35 miles per hour. Sky Valley, 37,000 palms. 30 miles per hour. Now these winds are something that are going to be staying with us throughout the rest of our Friday. Even at this hour, we're still talking about those gusts exceeding 20 miles per hour here for the valley floor, like Indio, as well as Desert Hot Springs. These strongest gusts are still going to be keeping themselves in the higher elevations along the mountain slopes and across the high desert. So Highway 62, keep in mind if you do have plans to head up into the high desert for this evening or even tomorrow morning, winds will be a factor. Be aware of any crosswinds that you encounter. And actually a wind advisory that's still in place has actually been extended, but for the local mountains extended through tomorrow afternoon at 4 p.m. So Highway 74 traveled through the San Gorgonio Pass. Same situation. Any debris that you may be finding on the roadways just allow a little bit extra time should you encounter any of those obstacles. So the wind stays with us through tonight, even into tomorrow morning. But for the valley floor, we're looking to be breezy tomorrow morning, not quite as gusty as what the mountains will be experiencing. Same as we head into the afternoon and evening hours. And then for Sunday, those winds will really begin to weaken and be nice and light. But it's those wind sheltered areas that are really going to be experiencing the opportunity for more widespread frost. A frost advisory has been issued just west of the Coachella Valley for the Inland Empire. We have a freeze warning for the high desert, including Joshua Tree National Park. Nothing specific for the Coachella Valley, but our temperatures will still be finding themselves in the 30s, especially for the East Valley. So any sensitive plants, bring them indoors. Pets, bring them indoors if you can. If not, just make sure that they have at least adequate shelter outside. Highs tomorrow looking to be sunny, but in the low 60s, and you pretty much get the same setup, whether you're going to San Diego, Diego, Los Angeles, or even if you're headed up the mountain, it'd be much colder there. So pack layers for Las Vegas. We're just talking plenty of sunshine and highs in the low 50s. But right here in the Coachella Valley, of course, we want the 60s to stick around because that is what we should be experiencing for this time of year. It's great. It's winter if you like that kind of thing. But we are looking to deal with yet another wind event. Unfortunately, as we go into Monday, more so into Tuesday. That's why those temperatures look to dip a little bit there for your New Year's Day. Slight warm up by the end of next work. Of the next work week. And it looks nice, you know. Uh, I, I do like the warmer temperatures, mm -hmm. but it's a nice change. You can finally pull out your winter gear, your winter clothes. Exactly. It's not like we don't get seasons here. Yeah. We're actually <laughs> experiencing a little bit of winter, but we know it doesn't always last that long. All right. Thank you, Haley. Well, a man booked several flights to spend Christmas with his daughter who works as a flight attendant. Yeah, I've never heard of a father doing that before. 
Next on News Channel 3, how he was able to pull off the feat to be with his daughter for the holiday. You're watching The Desert's News Leader. It was a story and photo that went viral yesterday. One father wasn't going to let his daughter's job stand in the way of spending time together on Christmas. Reporter Ali Hoxie spoke to the duo and to the man who shared their story with the world. Hal told me his story and I just thought it was very special of him to fly with his daughter for Christmas. When Mike and Hale started talking, he learned Hale is the father of one of the flight attendants. He also learned Hale wasn't really traveling anywhere, just traveling to spend time with his daughter on Christmas Day. It's such a unique story. I've never heard of a father doing that before. And I thought it was just such a great Christmas story about an amazing father and daughter. He took a picture of both Hale and Hale's daughter Pierce and shared their story on Facebook. Now this heartwarming story is going viral with more than 30,000 shares. My family and I try and spend time with each other no matter what, so we didn't think that this was like a big deal. Pierce Vaughn is from Mississippi, but currently lives in Ann Arbor. So spending time with family is not always easy to come by. Being a first year flight attendant, she expected to work Christmas. What she didn't expect is that her dad would be there along for the ride, something both her parents thought was the right thing to do. And my dad was like, well, I guess I'll just go with you. And I thought they were messing with me. I was like, that's really mean. Like, don't say that I'm going to be alone. And they were like, no, like, surprise, we've talked about it, and we think that your dad should go with you and spend the layover with you. In all, her father took six flights to be with Pierce. She says the experience is something she'll never forget. People are kind of making us appreciate that maybe not everyone has this kind of relationship with their parents and kids. What a sweet story. Well, local golf standout Charlie Ryder will compete in the Desert Classic this year. The Laquinta High School graduate and current USC Trojan 
played in the tournament last year, the Career Builder Challenge. Ryder made headlines last year when at age 17 he was one of just four Americans to make the cut at the Australian Open. As a junior, Ryder won the CIF Southern California Regional Championship, earning him a spot in the California State High School Championship. He also led his high school team to their first ever CIF, CIF State Tournament. Earlier this week, Ryder set the course record at the Palms in La Quinta with a score of 63. The event will be held from January 17th to the 20th at PGA West and La Quinta Country Club. Very cool. What an accomplishment. So impressive. Yeah. I was able to interview him once, one time, and he was so well spoken and obviously an excellent athlete. Really cool. Very cool to see him out here, especially like you were saying, in his own backyard. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. And what does weather look like? Backyards right now are chilly and a little bit of wind, depending on where you are in the Coachella Valley. But all of us were certainly feeling it at some point today. Some of those gusts exceeding 30 miles per hour. Guess what? Tomorrow, still going to be breezy for those of us here on the valley floor. High temperatures just in the low 60s. Plenty of sunshine, but those overnight lows, 30s and 40s here in the Coachella Valley. Patchy frost is expected, especially for the East Valley. Something to keep in mind, the more wind prone in or I guess when sheltered an area is, those temperatures will continue to drop. They're more susceptible to frost developing. It's chilly. It's winter weather. It is finally winter, yeah. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, thank you for making News Channel 3 your choice for news. Stay tuned for your network news.